analytics was not the strongest forte when i had joined uh, this side of things and uh, because you know i had a finance phd and i understood some bit of it uh, you know we were able to curate uh, some very basic things around you know what sort of numbers we are looking at india as a country is looking at and i think over time we realized value as an organization we realized that you know this is something that we would need uh, i think one of the biggest uses of data is data based policy making In our next episode, we have Dr. Preet Deep Singh with our cells, who is a Chief Analytics Officer and Vice President at Invest India. So he has like now spent around six to seven years at Invest India, and before Invest India, he was working within the corporate side, within the EY Transaction Advisory Services. So he has seen both of the sides, government as well as private sides, and he has led. one of the prominent initiatives at invest india like startup india and currently he is leading one district one product initiative at invest india from the education perspective he did his bachelor's from hindu college and he is also a company secretary and he did his phd from the indian institute of management in dabad so let's explore his journey and let's see what he has to offer thank you hi dr preet So uh, today in our episode in Sites Cafe with Ashmeet Singh, we are inviting uh, Dr. Preet Singh, who is the Chief Analytics Officer and Vice President in West India. So let's start, Dr. Preet. Your LinkedIn bio says that you handle ambiguity well. So I was thinking, like intuitively, what does this mean? So um, you know, a lot of times, if there is a project or there is an ask that where you know you don't have a lot of clarity, you know, think of it like brain droppings from any aspect. Um, I think I'm able to handle those well. you know given lack of clarity how do you ensure that something reaches a good uh, milestone i think i think i handle that part well i am okay not knowing what the next step will be or not knowing how the other threads tie into this um, i i am pretty comfortable with that a lot of a lot of people uh, would probably you know want to know who how where what yeah. what happens tomorrow how does it pan out i am i'm willing to take the plunge a lot of times without knowing everything okay so uh So let's go to your childhood and like during your childhood or like school time, how was your thinking mindset that there is a uniqueness, or we we think that yeah this thing that I was like I used to think in a big way or say I used to think about these these things so that had helped me to become what I am today. How would you see that ki in uh, my schooling I was a proactive kid or a, like a very reactive. How was your like schooling and childhood? So I was a very overconfident kid. <laughs> I okay. Was, I was a very <laughs> overconfident. uh kid i was i was of course blessed with some intellect and everything so that helped uh, you know to to keep the ball rolling you know as long as you do academically well uh, your school lets you lets you have your way in a lot of things and i think i was lucky in that extent that i was able to um, explore a lot i was able to experiment a fair bit i was able to understand what's working for me what's not working for me um i understood that i am able to motivate a couple of people to uh, do something for a bigger cause Okay. i think that that ties in closest to what i am doing today um i did have a, a a feeling of ensuring that you know we improve efficiency we help somebody else uh, apart from that i was i was fairly overconfident not the not the most pleasant uh in terms of uh, you know uh, how how people would sometimes be more understanding to uh, shortcomings i probably wasn't that kid Okay, so like, uh, so if you don't mind, where did you do, did your schooling? Bloom, Delhi. Okay, Bloom, Delhi. So you were into extra curricular, or like yeah, you, yeah, were, yeah. you were always into like no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, I was the head boy there. I was the literary council member. So yes, I, I, I used to do a fair bit of other things. I used to do quizzing. I used to do some bit of stuff others. Okay. Okay. So uh, if I. Uh, been through like gone through your educational background it's quite impressive going through like first hindu bachelor's in economics from hindu and then cs and then phd from iim ahmedabad so if if you can just like break this down how was the how that the journey happen and then transition to cs and then iim ahmedabad just the educational background from a perspective sure. of education so i wish i had planned it out better but uh, so i i really wanted to get into civil services so okay. which is why ba program with pol science and economics made sense okay uh, and i think at some point i decided that instead of stephens i want to go to hindu 
my my mom really liked hindu so that of course was a major major plus in that favor um i had in fact enrolled for ca uh, but uh, i think in my year the big change that came in was you could no longer do your articleship along with college yeah uh, it's, it's of course i think been 10 15 years that that rule came in but before that what happened was that everybody would enroll in a college attend college and you know starting 2 pm or whatever go for their article ships and then appear for whenever the exams were be uh, in my year that rule was changed so it was a pretty tough call if i want to do my ca full time or if i want to you know do college full time and then then do something uh, so cs actually had come up as uh, that you know this allows me to do both things okay. so which is how cs had come about i think after working for about a year or so i realized that i would want to be the last word the final authority on a few things uh you know as a company secretary of course i knew a fair bit but i realized that uh, you are usually termed as an expert after a phd uh, it was because that sort of a childish reason why i thought that you know i should probably pursue a phd and i just went ahead with it okay any specific reason like doing in finance from i am in the world it just it just made more sense as a company secretary my background was in corporate governance i understood okay. corporate laws i understood a lot of uh, you know just business uh, my class 12th was commerce uh, and accounting so i think that way it made a lot of sense to uh, figure this out uh, the, when the topics came up for uh, for you when i had to pick a stream in my phd i think it was a tough call between business policy and finance okay. and i think i just went with finance on a hunch okay uh, and now coming to your like the your working background basically so you have been into both sides of the table the corporate side while talking about ey tas and looking at the government sector and then at the investment dia side so i would love to know that what did you enjoy more one thing and the other thing is that you have you need a different kind of skill set when you are working in corporates and then when you are working in like in the government setup so how did you manage that and how did you play with that so i think one good thing is that uh, the requirements of the government setup have also become very corporate like i would say that you know earlier you couldn't be blunt you couldn't be open with ideas you couldn't try to bring in new stuff here that's that's the common perception i think there has been a lot of change there uh, a lot of novelty is encouraged now ideation is encouraged now uh, i think one major reason why i i survived the shift was because i was very keen on the scale of impact so the sort of scale that government allows you that is just unparalleled you know the world's biggest companies cannot give you what government does and that is the opportunity to improve lives for many at a single point in time mm-hmm. like you know even if all the corporates were to tie up they would probably impact 5 10 50 100 maybe 300 districts uh, the government policy impacts all 760 plus districts of the country so the mm-hmm. scale of impact the size of the opportunity is just amazing to keep you motivated uh, i of course like this side a lot more because of this one reason and one more thing like so someone is in his 20s and he's starting his career would you recommend him like he should spend some years in corporate and then come to government side or should he st- like start with the co- government side because i think you like brush up your skills more in corporate that you can you are able to apply in in the government setup because here you are like the stakes are high and the amount of credibility you require is I agree you know so a lot of times in government what happens is that there is there is so much uh, opportunity and scope to give in to this system that it will be great if you've uh, you know as you said polished your skill set beforehand that would that would really be helpful but you know if somebody already knows what they would want to do if they know that development sector is the thing for them public policy is the thing for them uh, gov advisory is the thing for them then then i don't mind if somebody starts their career with this because there are so many things that you learn only after being in the system for a year like mm-hmm. how do you evaluate an idea like how do you ensure that you harness tailwinds a lot of these things come in only with experience they cannot be really taught in a school or through a mentor or something like that so i would i would of course like it if somebody has spent a year or two in consulting first uh, but you know if you know that this is the thing for you uh, jump straight in okay so now like coming to the some of your pioneer projects in invest india uh, i would start with startup india initiative so you were the main lead in that you like 
you you took it forward and so how was that experience what was the vision behind it because in india in past some recent years we are looking at the unicorns and stuff like that so how was the vision so i and uh, asta used to co-lead the startup india team and uh, i had i had been involved with startups for a fairly long time i think starting 2000 uh, i don't know 14 or 15 before startup india actually came up uh, you know i would work with the gujarat government goa government and figure these things out so i think i was personally very sold on the entire startup innovation uh technology entrepreneurship idea and that mindset uh, i think i think that was an exciting time to be around uh, i think it still is great it's booming like anything i had uh, probably brought in the milestone of i think 25000 startups i think now we are touching 1 lakh startups so i think in that sense i i had i had a ball of a time it was really good uh, i also think that the sort of changes that were brought about by startup india and you know one of the one of the less talked about but one of the most important changes in my mind is how the acceptance for entrepreneurship has improved yeah. uh, in government circles as well as just generally in your house right uh, if people were to say that you know they're going to start up they're going to be an entrepreneur uh, 10 years 12 years back it probably would have led to a very different reaction as compared to now you know the people are a lot more supportive i think that is one of the bigger changes that that i am very proud of that you know we as a country have brought about onto ourselves and and what would be your general view on entrepreneurial journey say someone who wants to like start up i think it's not the cup of tea for everyone so how can one say that i have that grit or i have that perseverance that i can so your like five things that you would mention about an entrepreneurial journey like one should have from your experience i think i think if you've got one point that is you are really sold on the problem uh some startups are more sold on the solution uh, that doesn't work because you know you need to as a startup you might have to pivot so many times uh, so you know somebody had given me this example that uh if there is a problem with uh, that you can solve using ai some uh, bot as well as you know a few people and coders that's great but if you can solve the same problem with markers and paper pins you know you might have to pivot your original idea mm-hmm. because if you can solve it with that then that is the right solution that is a cheaper easier more convenient more efficient more reliable solution so you need to be very very sold on the problem that you are solving the value that solving that problem will create for your customer and consumer you cannot think that you know i have created this app this program this product this device and now i have to ensure that this device gets sold you know i think that is that is a major thing i think if you're sold on that problem then handling ambiguity comes easy then uh, that whole risk comes easy uh, you know at least for the first couple of years you will be earning much lower than your peers you will not have your own car you will probably not have uh, a lot of vacations uh, you will probably not have a lifestyle that some of your peers might have uh, but if you are really convinced on the problem i think those problems can be overcome so just one thing uh, convinced on the problem okay so uh, generally we have seen ceos ceos but your designation is quite unique chief analytics officer so what does it take like from that designation and uh, like how do you think that analytics like chief analytics officer how analytics is taking a day to day life so uh, analytics was not the strongest forte when i had joined uh, this side of things and uh, because you know i had a finance phd and i understood some bit of it uh, you know we were able to curate uh, some very basic things around you know what sort of numbers we are looking at india as a country is looking at and i think over time we realized value as an organization we realized that you know this is something that we would need uh, i think one of the biggest uses of data is data based policy making so if today i have to let's say identify a product for promoting in exports or you know come up with a scheme to promote exports for a particular product it would make sense for me to look at what is the current export what is the world export who are our competitors is the world export growing or decreasing over the past 5 years has india's share gone up or gone down over the past 5 years and a large challenge of data is figuring out how do you match two data sets and create value out of it so a lot of data is of course available on data.gov.in right it's like an open open data portal but how do you combine let's say demographics district level data gdp export data and international trade data 
to create a sort of scheme or policy to this effect so i think i think in that sense it became very important that we have a dedicated team uh, use of automation and ai to just understand nuances insights and signals into what companies are doing before they actually do it you know before it becomes news for everyone how can how can the government remain one step ahead in that sense i think that is where the whole analytics part came in okay and the uh, like these days there are buzzwords like data science machine learning ai after chat gpt coming in it's like getting more so uh, how do you think ai do you think that it's like a threat or it's like an opportunity how can one materialize on it i think uh, one of these uh, studies i was reading i think it was a bcg study which said that uh, this is probably the first technology where the leaders are much more aware uh, as compared to the frontline managers or the workers you know which is strange because in every time in tech you know you would have the techies who would be the most aware and techies essentially would not be top of the pyramid with ai CEOs are three times more aware as compared to your entry level workers right mm. which changes things in a very difficult way because tomorrow if we need to harness this then we need to ensure that our entry level workers are aware of this then we need to ensure that our entry level workers are comfortable using this and they understand the shortcomings also if they don't understand the shortcomings they might be using it for something where you know they will embarrass themselves uh, i i heard that this lawyer recently used this for a court case and some of the cited cases in his uh, petition were actually non existent because chat gpt throws no, those sort of things be. now if our entry level workers are not aware of these things it will be very difficult for them uh, the other is that you know once you improve productivity you create a lot more jobs you create newer jobs yes but you create a lot more jobs so i think in that sense it's pretty great and it's it's not a sentient being so we don't really have to think about you know agi coming in and uh, you know a terminator sort of a situation that does not seem to be very likely i think but it does seem like a human ai collaboration cooperation will lead to immense productivity boost in the next 3 to 5 years and from a policy perspective what do you think like he, uh, could be a, like a good policy in regulating this ai just, i think just uh, a general yeah i think uh, europe has come up with a ai policy where uh, you know they've defined some clear don'ts and they've used a pyramid based risk based approach so which means that you know some things will be open for all anybody can do anything some things will be light regulation some things will be heavy regulation and some things will be a complete no i think uh, that is one big model uh, we've got we've got a few bigger issues especially with image generation which is copyright you know uh, does getty images get their copyright claim or not because if you've trained data on their images the new image that will be created do they have a say in that or not should they get royalty out of that or not so i think these are difficult questions that we'll all have to grapple with we'll all have to figure japan of course says that you know they don't have a copyright law and this is uh, th- that they don't have a copyright a uh, claim and this is covered under fair use uh, but you know these are things that we'll have to figure as we go along so currently uh, currently from the invest india perspective you are leading odop one district one product initiative so what's like a broader vision behind it to put at least one product from each district of the country on the world map as simple as that you know if you are from patiala uh, you probably thinking fulkari if you are from kolapur you thinking kolapuri chappal if you are from uh, i don't know from uh, bihar you are thinking sikki grass right so a lot of our districts have an uh, a distinct product that is known for it you know agra uh, mathura pede right uh, you, you can think of malabar pepper malabar paratha so many products that really need some bit of polishing cleaning putting them out there so that they are recognizable at a world level uh, you know kashmir saffron has made its name pashmina has made its name uh, kanihama shawls yes we can still promote them so similarly how do we ensure that every district of the country gets on and gets on to the world map and then you know the district is known has its own global identity there okay and uh, so talking about you have done your phd from finance how do you like manage your finance in, in a personal level like uh, how, how, what is your relationship with money i i don't manage i don't actively manage a lot of it i just invest it in one or two things uh, okay. index based funds or gold okay so it's like um, passive uh, very passive very passive yeah. okay and uh, like uh, generally apart from your professional career what do you do to like have a get of going and what's like your basically uh, sp- what drives you 
what drives me apart from work very hard but i do like to play golf i am very bad at golf but i do like to play golf okay and is like is there any spiritual routine that you follow or kind of a little bit i try i try my best on that front yes okay okay i think i think this is it for today thank you so much dr uh, preet for my your pleasure, presence Preet. and uh, it was really great to have you on the uh, episode for the episode and it's really great thank you so much my pleasure thank, thank you, you.